Okay. Hey, welcome everybody. Good afternoon from the San Francisco Public Library. It's a virtual event presentation of Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, where we are bringing to you a book talk with writer Budget Tan and artist Kajo Baldisivo, creators of the award-winning serialized urban fantasy graphic novel and upcoming Netflix series, Trece. Let's hear it for them. You shout out the love from uh, on your um, chat. Also, we'd like to share, uh, have folks share where they're coming from around the world. If you'd like to let us know where you're all joining us from. So uh, first off, I'd like to share a, uh, a um, land acknowledgement because uh, we here in San Francisco are living on the uh, unceded land of the Ohlone tri tribal people. So we want to acknowledge the many Ramaytush Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards of the lands on which we reside. The San Francisco Public Library is committed to uplifting the name of these lands and community members from these nations with whom we live together. The San Francisco Public Library encourages you to learn more about first person culture and land rights and are committed to hosting and events and providing educational resources on these topics. And another thing that we'd also like to acknowledge uh, during Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, it's a more, more serious issue to uh, address is the anti-Asian violence that is uh, rampant throughout this country, including here in the Bay Area. So we'd like to share our uh, library statement on, on what is happening to our Asian and uh, Asian American communities. We condemn the horrendous violence against Asian and Asian Americans in our communities, our state, nationwide, both the reported and invisible crimes that have occurred. It is unconscionable for Asians and Asian Americans to be targeted for violence and murdered. It is unconscionable for our Asian elders to be harmed by these actions. And we stand with our Asian communities, neighbors and colleagues distressed and hurt by these attacks. Asian communities' demands for safety and respect are heard by us at the library. The library is determined to work with our city and communities to recognize and dismantle the discrimination and violence that has been perpetrated. We acknowledge that these are events are complicated by the entanglement of anti-Black and anti-Asian stereotypes in the reporting of these acts of violence. We also acknowledge the reduction in humanity and harm done to the Black community by the coverage and hateful commentary that has been deployed. Anti-Black and anti-Asian racism both uphold white supremacy. We are still harmed by these racial structures. We, racist structures, excuse me. We believe everyone has a stake in dismantling white supremacy in favor of a true multiracial democracy. We firmly believe that a truly equitable society cannot exist until we dismantle all dimensions of racism. We must remain vigilant and continue to create a compassionate and welcoming environment that is inclusive of our staff, our patrons, and the public. And we wanted to share this uh, great quote from the activist, Chinese American activist, Grace Lee Boggs, the only way to survive is by taking care of one another. I think that's something we all want to live and stand by today and in always in and in the future. Thank you. Oh, this is for acknowledgements at the end. Uh, so we, we can share, move on uh, to, yeah. And this is uh, an event that's gonna be coming on later on um, in this month. So for the, Instead of supernatural crime, we'll be uh, visiting uh, regular crime and punishment in, in through the uh, debut book of um, Chicago-based author Mia P. Manansala, who will be debuting her uh, um, novel, crime novel, Arsenic and Adobo. So please join us uh, May 18th, another virtual event with San Francisco Public Library. And also uh, one of our sponsors today, Archipelago Books, 
is uh, selling Tresse One, the U.S. edition. So we encourage you to visit their website. Uh, they do have copies available. So please support independent bookstores. Next slide. And also uh, coming soon uh, with with Archipelago covering them are, are Tresse Two and Three. I, I believe. Uh, Kajo's uh, working on, well, probably has finished two and is working on, on three. So uh, give a shout out when, later on when we, we bring him on live. Okay, so let me continue uh, on to our the introductions here. This event is a community partnership with the, you know, with us, the Filipino American Center Library uh, with, with me representing as librarian. Uh, we are the only, um, Filipino American Center in a US public library system. And our mission is to really highlight the Filipino Americans experience. Uh, the center contains materials in English, Filipino and other languages from the Philippines. Another sponsor is our great uh, supporting group, the Friends of the San Francisco Public Library. Another great community partner who, who's uh, celebrating 50 years as, as an institution in the city and county of San Francisco is the Philippines Studies Department of City College, the only Philippine Studies Department in California and the oldest of its kind in this world. As I mentioned, Archipelago Books, they are a San Francisco based community institution for over 20 years and a distributor of books from the Philippines and Filipino American titles. As I mentioned, they are carrying a Blaze one and will carry the whole uh, US of Blaze series. And then also uh, PAWA, Philippine American Writers and Artists, a Northern California based organization and independent publisher of Filipino American literature. PAWA's main goal is to create and encourage literature and the arts for the preservation and enrichment of Filipino American historical, cultural, and spiritual values. PAWA is also the anchor organization for the biennial Filipino American International Book Festival or Phil Book Fest. So Phil Book Fest was supposed to be happening this year, but due to COVID, we've, uh, the COVID pandemic, and we, it has been moved to October 14th uh, through the 16th in 2022 here at the main library in San Francisco. So think about that uh, time, put it on your calendar and, and please join us uh, next year. So this May, as I met, we know is um, Asian American, um, Pacific Islander History Month, and we are spotlighting the cultures of, of many uh, peoples from around that area of, of the world and stuff today. So we bring you this May 8th uh, a panel event with Trece um, creators, Budget Tan and artist Kajo Baldissimo. So let me uh, introduce our guests for today as we will begin our journey into the world of Trece. Uh, Kajo Baldissimo is a cartoonist and co-creator of Trece. He is an avid reader of Filipino comics from the 80s and the 90s. He draws storyboards for a living and create comic, comic books to live. After spending 40 years of his life in Makati City, he is now permanently residing in Davao City, trying to establish an animal shelter together with his wife and son. And our next guest is Budget Tan. He is the writer and co-creator of Tresi. He also co collaborated with Bao Guerrero and JB Tapia in creating the Dark Colony books. He is also co-editor and co-writer of the Alejandro Pardo books with David Hontiveros. Recently, he co-edited with Charis Lok, the Southeast Asian comic book Sound, a comic anthology published by Different Engine. He currently works for the Lego agency in Denmark and lives there with his super wife and their super, their little super boy. And, our, and last but not least, our moderator for today's program is Carl Angel. He is a visual artist who grew up in Honolulu, Hawaii. Carl is the illustrator of numerous books, including La Casse and the Manila Town Fish, Sky High, The True Story of Maggie G, and The Girl Who Saved Yesterday and the Forthcoming, Pedros Yoyos. He is also the art director and designer of many books from Children's Book Press and Lian Lo. His art is included in the anthologies honoring our ancestors and on our block. 
He lives with his wife and son in Burbank, California. So thank you all for joining us today, Carl, Kajo, and Budget. Yay! Let's go into the world of Tresse. Take us there, Carl. Okay. Uh, first of all, can everybody hear me? I just want to make sure. Okay. All right. Good. Um, well, I want to thank, uh, first of all, I want to thank SFPL and Abe for having me um, take part in this conversation. Uh, I was telling Budget before we started that I'm going to try and keep myself as contained as possible because um, I'm such a fan. And, uh, you know, I'm a little intimidated. Well, this is my first time, full disclosure, and I'll try and get all this out of the way as soon as possible. First time interviewing anybody, really. So, um, uh, and yet I feel like I'm in the, I'm the one who's being grilled. I don't know why, but um, <laughs> the expectations are high. Um, and uh, you guys have superseded all of them with this book. Uh, um, thank you, SFPL, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, gentlemen, for, uh, for doing this. Um, I guess I was telling also the rest of the staff that we're basically covering all sleep cycles here. So I would say <laughs> good afternoon to everyone in the States. Good evening to those in Denmark. Good morning to those in Davao <laughs> in the Philippines. So we've got, we've got the world watching here. Um, there's a lot of people uh, that registered to see uh, this presentation. And so, and, and well worth it and well deserved. Uh, you guys are heroes of mine. Um, Tracy came into my orbit uh, fairly um, recently, but um, just about a year ago. And I just kept tabs on it. And uh, I just, uh, um, when, I, when I read it, I just became an instant fan. It's, um, I mean, I guess it doesn't hurt if you get an endorsement from Neil Gaiman, but <laughs> I would put this, I would put this up alongside anything that anybody has ever done. Um, what what's amazing about the world well actually you know what for the uninitiated budget why don't you introduce us to the character of tracy and the world and uh that she comes from um yeah so uh thank thanks carl thanks abe uh thank you everyone who uh, invited us to be here uh and thank you to everyone who just woke up is not really awake is maybe sleepwalking and pretending to watch this and it's all a, a dream. Um, uh, so yeah, so so uh, quick uh, pitch on what uh, Alexander Tres is all about. Uh, Trese is about um, paranormal investigator Alexandra Trese, who investigates the strange, weird cases that happen in Metro Manila, and uh, and it usually involves Aswan, Chanak, Encanto, and Multo. And what makes her different from all other detectives is she uses magic spells too. Daddy. And there is. <laughs> are you? Are you a? What are you? Are you a duende? Are you a duende? What are you? Why are you still awake? Uh, Someone. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> So there, so maybe Kanzo can take over while I put this little boy to bed. <laughs> I'll wait for you, bud. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can tell it better. I'll be, give me two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody well, basically, will. it's it's almost, it's it's sort of a mix of, um, of you know, CSI, uh, for those, you know, um, more modern, I was about to date myself by saying Carl Kochak, the Night Stalker. Uh, now everybody knows how old I am. But, um, but uh, it, it draws from all sorts of genres. Um, and what's amazing about it is that it's familiar. Uh, I mean, it's fresh, but yet familiar. Um, because, you know, I grew up with these kinds of stories and we all grew up with... Um, being told, uh, you know, um, forbidding tales of what we would do by our parents or, or what would happen to us if a creature would come and grab us in the middle of the night or there's a boogeyman. We've all had our boogeyman stories when we were, you know, growing up. And, um, and in, Fil in Filipino folklore, there's a lot of boogeymen. 
Um, there, uh, you know, there's there's over a thousand islands. There's over there's different there's different religions, different beliefs, indigenous and otherwise. And I mean, the wealth of underworld material is vast um, in Filipino folklore. And uh, the thing that I'm so impressed by with uh, with but with budget and Kajo were able to do is that they cracked the code. I mean, and it's funny because it, it, it didn't seem like there was, it seems so natural the way that they did it. Um, it's probably an immense task to, uh, to gather, uh, or if, if not intimidatingly so, to um, take in all the different types of folklore that the Philippine, that Filipino culture has and to try and make it accessible and, and fun and not academic. Um, I myself had done a series on Filipino folklore, just a series of paintings uh, back when I had just graduated from college. Uh, uh, I won't say when, but back then there weren't a lot of resources for, um, for me to look at. There was maybe one overdue library paperback book and, um, and everything else was looking uh, at Berkeley Library for um, you know just card catalogs and resources and stuff. There was no internet and um, you know, uh, it was just, it was this thing of discovery uh, for me. And so since then, I mean, with the advent of the internet and just uh, with uh, a deeper awareness that um, the next generation is having about their heritage, uh, there is just more coming out. And, um, and even with the amount of resources coming out, which is great, it just shows how vast uh, the stories are, how vast the tales are and the amount of material there is. Now to take all that and then to be able to, um, to make it accessible and fun and, uh, and natural, I guess this is the only way I can put it because there's nothing about the storytelling that Kajo and uh, Budget have that, that seems um, deliberate or, or, or it's so brilliantly realized um, that it's almost like budget budget had just sort of opened a door and and Kadra just they, like the two of these guys had just opened a door and all of a sudden there you are you're 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 in it with this detective and um, if I may say so before I quickly turn it back over to budget so I don't ruin his synopsis um, is that this character of Alexandra Trace is, is she's ahead of her time. I mean, these guys started it 16 years ago. Now, I mean, you have the reiteration of the Kung Fu TV series. You have Raya and the Last Dragon, these strong, powerful heroines. Well, she was the pioneer 16 years ago. I mean, you had Disney princesses and stuff that could sing. Uh, I, to this date, I haven't seen Alexandra or haven't read anything about Alexandra Trace musical numbers or anything like that aided by, by fuzzy animals or anything. But that's coming that's up wait. probably, right? That's your <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's wait. But in, this, in the character of Alexandra Trece, um, what I found was somebody, and it's funny how Kaja depicts her, um, she is slight. Uh, and she's, you know, on her side are two bodyguards, you know, her, her brothers. And, um, and these guys, they seem kind of imposing. And you would think that, oh, you know, they're there to kind of protect her. But when the way that, that Kajo frames it in his drawings and the way that Budget writes her, there's, it's almost like they're holding her back, you know? <laughs> because uh, she is, she speaks very kind of succinctly. She goes right, I mean, it's like a real detective, but there's no, there's no lack of self-assuredness about this character. And, um, and the fact that she's, like this much, you know, the guys are here, this tall and she's like there, but you still think, oh, she's the boss and she's here for business. And these guys, you know, are, are at her command. I mean, it's, it's amazing that you have a female character that's that strong without, without these guys having to point arrows at her saying that she's a strong character. And it's a tribute and a testament to Budget's writing and the way that Kajo frames a page. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, 
I mean, I, you can just open up to any any page in that in this book, and it's, I mean, what the hell? <laughs> you know, I mean, this is. Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll we'll talk shop later. But anyway, um, all right, I covered for you, budget. <laughs> keep, on going, keep on going more with with how the, like with how the world was um, was you know what what you think of the world. I was talking about how in Filipino folklore there is a lot of, there's a wealth of underworld material, yes. you know? I mean, yes. at least, and I was saying that when I when I first discovered it, there was hardly anything. Now there's all this stuff. I mean, I'm sure that both of you guys are probably students of Maximo Ramos, just to name one. But I mean, uh, I mean, how how aware of you, how aware of, not you, of, of Filipino folklore were you, um, both of you, uh, when coming up, when, uh, when coming up, with this idea, I mean, was it sort of a a horse before the cart sort of thing? Had this always kind of been brewing, um, or what? Or for Kaja, when you when you had that kind of epiphany moment, was it an epiphany when you said, "You know what, budget and I got to work together," or uh, and that came to it, or was it, um, you know, go ahead, take over. Um, if I get yeah, if it's okay, Carl, I I I put together a little show and tell. Great. Um, so I think it, it should answer like some of the basic questions, and then I'm sure you guys and the, the rest of the uh, the readers uh, will will probably grill us. But but yes, just to answer your first question, uh, we uh, a lot of people think that we are you know experts and scholars as far as uh, Philippine lore mythology is concerned, and we're not. You know, uh, it's just that we got surrounded by the right kind of people or maybe by the wrong kind of people. Um, and uh, it was only, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, it was only later on that I did discover Maximo Ramos's uh, books. Uh, but yeah, if it's okay, I will uh, share screen Great. and take you through, I hope really quickly, the secret origin of, of Trece. Oh. Okay, I hope I am allowed to share screen. Yes. 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 Thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, uh, people in the background. <clears throat> so, uh, and just to ch and just like any business meet Zoom meeting, can you see my screen? <laughs> Is the yeah. question. Yes. All right. Yep. Yep. Yes. All right. Fantastic. Um, so yeah. So allow me to take you a tour of magical Manila. And, and for those of you who grew up in Manila, you might say, Dah, Manila's not like that, but this is Manila from our point of view. Um, and this is what eventually led to the birth of Trece. Um, so yeah, Manila, Metro Manila is now, and I just Googled it, uh, 14 million people living in Metro Manila. It would have been cooler to say 13 million, but yes, we just keep uh, giving birth to more people. It's a, it's a great, this is a great shot of, of Metro Manila to show how modern it is. This is the picture I show to my colleagues here in Denmark to show them, you know, it's not all uh, pretty beaches in the Philippines. But what I love about Manila, of course, is that we still cling to traditions and to our faith. Uh, that in the middle of a very modern metropolis, you have churches that are over 400 years old. And that, um, you know, even in churches like Capo, right in front of it, you have people who will sell you what they say are magical amulets, you know, anting anting. They will sell you potions and candles that will supposedly heal you and cure you. So it's an interesting mix of, you know, embracing a, a modern first world uh, um, tech, you know, technology and, and moving forward, but at the same time, we're still pretty much grounded uh, with the things that we believe in. In the 1980s, this is what I grew up seeing on newspaper headlines, that a manananggal was attacking people in Sampalo. So to me, as a kid, seeing this in a newspaper, me, it, to me, it signaled they must be real. You know, it, they, these aswang must be uh, uh, real life monsters out there because the newspaper, I didn't know it was a tabloid, are uh, reporting about it, right? 
So one of the, in my research, one of the interesting articles I found came out in the Daily Express in 1973. And it was about a house in Merville subdivision in Paranaque that was supposedly haunted. Um, a new couple had moved into the house with their relatives and their newborn baby. And it, you know, if you, if you read the report, it would go through the usual uh, you know, haunted house stories of like lights switching on and off, voices would be heard coming from empty rooms, um, objects would be moving by themselves. Supposedly at one time, you know, uh, one of the occupants of the house woke up uh, to get a drink from the kitchen and he saw his chinelas walking away from him. Um, and all of these things were happening except to the mother in the house. And she said she didn't believe any of those stories. And one summer afternoon, she had just given a bath to her six month old baby. And so she puts the baby on the bed, she turns around to get the clothes. And the moment she looks back at her baby, half of the, her baby's face had wrinkled up like an old man's face and the eye turned gray. And in that instant, she realized that all of those stories of the hauntings were real. And in that split second, she realized that a spirit had possessed her child. And the only thing she could think of doing was she, she slapped her baby. She slapped that baby hard and commanded the spirit to leave the child. But the thing on the bed didn't cry. It just stared back at her as if daring her to do it again. And that's when she got down on her knees and she started to pray. And she said it felt like she prayed to every saint she knew. And she prayed to the Virgin Mary and she prayed and prayed and prayed until her baby's face returned to normal. According to the news report, the couple who lived there was Buddy Tan. The mother's name is Ajit Tan. And the baby's name is budget then that was my childhood i don't know what's worse being made to wear this fuchsia jumper or getting possessed by that spirit but that was that was so this is the story i grew up with so i grew up with my dad telling me oh you know there's a swan outside the window don't you know it's bedtime don't get off the bed and my mom would tell me these stories of, you know, when you were a child, you were possessed by a spirit of, the, of a haunted house. So again, it was like, this, is, this was normal for me. Um, and I guess Tresa is, Tresa is dealing with the trauma of, of <laughs> growing up in that kind of household. So are, um, you, are you in therapy budget? <laughs> I think I think comics has become my therapy. Okay. okay. Um, uh, it was uh, so. Let let's let's skip the therapy part. Um, in wow. 1994, me and a group of guys, including Kajo, which is where we met, formed a group called Alamat Comics. <clears throat> um, and some of us were fresh out of college. Kajo was still in college at the time. And, you know, we thought we were going to be the next big thing. You know, we, we had big dreams of becoming the next Marvel in DC and Image Comics. But as you might have noticed, you're all going, we've never heard of these titles. And yes, some of these titles never got beyond issue one. But, you know, that, that dream of wanting to do comics just was something that we, we I guess, never let go of. Um, <clears throat> so it was in... 2005, uh, you know, so that was 1994, cut to what, 11 years later, 2005, Kajo uh, sends me a text message that he says, you know, hey, Budge, you want to make a comic book? So, and, and the text message was, you know, Budge, some of us want monthly comics. Uh, and we were both working for ad agencies at the time. And it felt like, and if you work in an ad agency, there's very little time for anything else. So I thought, you know, how could we possibly do this? But, my, but Kajo was the one who made the commitment and said, if you can give me a 20 page script, I can draw it in 20 days. So by the end of, you know, the, the 20 days, we would have a comic book. 
So what happened, and that's how, and that's how Trece was born. Trece was uh, a character um, I came up with a few years back. And it was greatly inspired by detective stories. And, and Carl, I heard you mention Carl Kolchak. Carl Kolchak is another big influence in Trece, uh, along with Fox Mulder, Gil Grissom, uh, John Constantine, and Batman. Um, so when, and I couldn't finish the Trece script when I was trying to write him as a guy, as, as Anton Trece, tough, you know, Pinoy detective. But when Kajo sent me that text, um, and I sent him uh, a script of Trece and he drew Trece as a tough guy. Um, and he's emailed me back the, the first sketch of Trece as, as this, you know, really cool looking dude. I said, wow, this, this might just work, this, this crazy idea of Kajo. But then something clicked in my head and I said, why does this tough guy look so typical? Which just made me think, and I texted Kajo back and said, what if Trese was a woman? And Kajo just replied, oh, that would make her so badass, is what <laughs> Kajo said. And in the same day, Kajo sends me a new sketch of Trese uh, with that, with a devil's haircut and that, you know, intense look on her face. Yeah. And that's been her character design ever since. I mean, I didn't, I don't think I even had a description for, for Trese. I just said, you know, this is what she's all about. And, and somehow Kajo came up with that character in look. Um, and, and, and that's been the same look. We've, we've never changed. Uh, it did not go through, you know, different designs or anything like that. Um, and, and thus she became our supernatural detective. Um, we photocopied the first issue of Trece back in 2005 and sold it for 30 pesos, which is less than a dollar because we were afraid no one would buy it. Um, three years later, we got picked up by Visprint, who has been our publisher ever since in the Philippines. And yes, as you guys have talked about last year, uh, Ablaze came out with uh, the US edition of Trece. Um, and we, by, we, before this year ends, book through two and three will come out. And later this year, uh, the anime uh, will be uh, streaming on, on Netflix. Um, and a lot of the cases of Trece, of course, are based on creatures of Philippine myth and folklore. Um, this was the book that uh, Carl was talking about, or Abe was talking about earlier, um, wherein we wrote essentially like a guidebook to most of these uh, or to some of the interesting ones that we, we thought were worth mentioning. Um, Maximo Ramos, of course, has written, chronicled, I don't know, hundreds of these creatures from all of our islands. Um, so we have the Aswang, of course, uh, which has taken many shapes and forms depending what province you're in. We have our creatures who live underground, like the Duende, which is our version of the dwarf. We have the Nuno Sapunso, which is where we all learn to say tabi tabi po. If you see a mound of dirt, especially if it's near a tree, be and make sure you do not piss on the mound of dirt because if you hit the Nuno, the Nuno will cast a sumpa, a curse on you, and make you sick. Mm -hmm. um, the Manananggal, uh, which uh, to a lot of, especially foreign readers, are so. Uh, horrified when they find out what the Manananggal is all about. The Tikbalang, which is supposedly found on uh, crossroads in the province, and it's the reason why you get lost in the forest, or it would challenge you to a wrestling match. And if you lose that match, you go insane. But supposedly, if you can beat the Tikbalang, and the way to beat the Tikbalang is to, to uh, wrestle it and get one hair from its mane, and that will make the tikbalang subservient to you and will grant you a wish, supposedly. And I, I also, through research, I discovered the San Telmo, or our version of St. Elmo's fire, which is supposedly seen as a ball of fire bouncing on you know, uh, a, a dirt road, or fishermen have seen this bouncing on the horizon of the sea. 
And supposedly this ball of fire are spirits of people who died at that spot, but did not get the proper burial. So that they were, you know, this is their way of calling out for help. Um, so all of those stories, you know, I uh, grew up with or discovered through uh, hearing it from family and friends and from research. And when we started to create Trece, the main question we always ask is, where are they now in the city? Um, and this was greatly inspired by Neil Gaiman's American Gods mm. and his Sandman. That's the very same question he asks. Uh, he asked when he created American Gods, did all of these old gods come with, the, with you know, when people migrated to America, did they bring their gods with them? And where are they now? So I took that same question and applied it to a Manila context. So the Nuno Sapunso is now a Nuno Samanhol and is uh, an informant of Trece as far as things in the underworld is concerned. The Manananggal who loves to, you know, attack pregnant women and suck the babies out of their bellies are now flying around the high-rise condos and apartments of Makati and Ortigas, and that's where they're looking for babies. And some of them have formed a kidnapping ring, and they get into gang wars with other aswang. And that's where Tresa needs to come in and stop these gang wars. The Tikbalang now waits at the highways, at motorways, and challenges people to drag races instead of wrestling with them. And the deal is the same. If you lose, you lose your you lose your car, and that's why there are accidents that happen on particular streets uh, in Metro Manila. Uh, but if you are able to defeat the tik outrace the tikbalang, then he would grant you a wish. And the Santelmo is now a fire elemental that Trese can summon using her cell phone uh, in order to investigate other crimes committed by fire elementals. And like I said, Dresa uses magic spells to um, investigate crime. So for example, she needs to see, um, they, they find the body of the victim and they need to find out who was the last person that this victim was looking at before he or she died. And what Dresa would do is she would get her Chris, her magical dagger, and she would pluck out the eyeball, yeah, right. put it on a, on a white handkerchief, fold it, say the magic word. She stabs it, and when she opens the handkerchief, an image appears on the white handkerchief. And is that this, something that you came up with? Or is that, is that like, that's, all this stuff is so outrageous, you know? I mean, is that something that you came up with? Or is that a... Uh, this is a, it's a, it's a mix of, of several things. So um, uh, the whole concept of, um, uh, the the image of uh, an image being imprinted on the on the eyeball of a victim came from Sherlock Holmes. Mm. It was a belief in the in, in during that time that uh, that the if somebody dies that the image of of whatever he was looking at he or she is looking at gets imprinted in the in the retina. Uh, or the iris of, of, the, of the victim. So supposedly during that time, there were people who were experimenting and they would take photographs of the eyeball and try to you know, uh, expand that photo, trying to figure out the image. So that's where that idea came from. And I just needed to figure out what is, if that's the scientific way of doing it, what's the magical version of it? Um, the other source of this is um, if you are familiar with the ritual of the uh, pagtatawas, so to find out if there is a encanto living in your house or your, your land, uh, you do a, a, a tawas ritual, which is supposedly you get a basin of water, you get a basin, fill it with water, you get a white candle, you light it, you say prayers, and you let candle wax drip on the water the wax is supposedly going to take the shape of a face or a creature. And that's how the Mang Tatawas knows what kind of creature is living in your land. So I just mashed up those two things and this spell is what came out.
isn't it? So it was a natural thing for you to take all these underworld figures and then uh, in terms of mythical underworld and then personify them like like crime underworld. Was that, that just seemed like a natural thing? I mean, that, that oh, these guys are going to fly around condos. These guys are going to, I mean, where did that part come from? I think it was it was really that this it was um, because I I had I had written a bunch uh, I had written a bunch of ghost stories set in Metro Manila with a friend of mine Mark Gatella who by the way Mark is the one who came up with the name Anton Trese so we wrote all of these ghost stories based in Manila and they were really inspired a lot by Stephen King Twilight Zone Tales from the Crypt. But they were, you know, they were your typical one-off stories that, you know, would usually end with, and the man saw the lady in white and he went insane. And, you know, it, was, it would be these open-ended stories. Right. So to me, it was like, I, I want an ending. <laughs> I need to know where the white lady came from. And that's where the thought of, well, maybe there should be a detective figuring these things out. So it was really taking all of those supernatural stories and then putting a detective story lens in front of it and, and trying to figure out you know, the, the, the mystery and secret behind it. Um, and so, so we, we come to this and um, for those, I, I would have really wanted, I would have really loved to um, um, show you a trailer to the Trece Netflix anime, but of course Netflix would probably send their uh, right, right. their yeah. aswang <laughs> yeah. to stop me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, so, um, so what I'd love to do for you now is to give you a preview for those of you who haven't read Trece, um, a reading of the first couple of pages of Trece. And then let's continue with, and, and then I'll stop talking and let Kancho take over. <laughs> Ready, um, <Kajo. laughs> All right. No, so but this is, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Got questions. Um, so again, yeah, this is the first uh, story of Trece, and it's and uh, we were talking to Lily May earlier about Ballet and Drive, and yes, you know, I was. It was one of those times when, <clears throat> whenever we would go to my grandmother's house and then go home, Ballet and Drive was one of those roads we'd always pass. And, you know, someone in the car would always say, oh, you know, this street is haunted by a white lady. And then the thing is, every time I hear the story of the white lady, somebody has a different version of it, right? Um, so to me, I just thought, okay, I want to write the definitive secret origin of the white lady. And um, we start the story with the white lady. But in this case, instead of her frightening people, she's the victim. So the story starts with the white lady of Balete Drive being found dead on the street. And Trese needs to investigate who wants to kill the white lady. And more importantly, how do you kill a ghost? So here's at the intersection of Balete and 13th Street. The night wind howls like a wounded dying animal. One might think the street was mourning this particular death. Do we take away the body now? No, not yet. Wait, she's on her way. Sir, the Soko already collected all the important evidence. Good evening, Captain Guerrero. Thanks for calling me. Hello, Alexandra. I had a feeling you'd want to see this for yourself. Of course, it's not every day a white lady is found dead especially on this street. So what do you know so far? Looks like your typical automobile accident until one of the neighbors identified the victim. Her name was Gina Santos. And the neighbor said, as far as they remember, she died back in the 1960s. Hmm, interesting. What's this? And she sees dust on the road, white dust or white powder. She smells it and tastes it and says, salty. Seems like we're missing the bigger picture here. And that's when Trese notices that the white dust was used to create a big circle around that intersection. Guerrero says, and it seems like as usual, you're the only one who has a clue on what this is all about. 
Actually, I don't, but I'll look into it. Thanks. And Teresa walks down the street and sees a mound of dirt. And that's when she says, Tabi Tabi Po, good evening Po. Psst, nobody stays there anymore. And a hand lifts up the manhole and says, not a good place to stay, always lots of litter, garbage, not good at all. Good evening, sir. Can I ask you some questions? Depends who's asking. My name is Alexandra Trese and, ah, you're Anton Spawn. Okay, okay, what do you want to know? Did you see what happened here tonight? No, no, I try not to get involved in such things. This was on the street. Do you know what it is? Hmm, yes, salty, ancient. So what is this powder? It's mermaid, the bones of a mermaid, ground to dust. Fine, very useful if one wants to trap spirits. Highly recommended, better than iodized salt. <laughs> so, and where does one find ground up mermaid bones? Sorry, I wouldn't know, not my territory. Don't like the sea so much. That would be a good place to start, the sea. Good night, little Grace. Careful where you tread. That's the end of the preview. And I just wanted to end, last two slides, I wanted to end with this slide and say, back in the 60s, the, you know, Filipino comics out sold, out circulated any printed material, even newspapers. It was, you know, sold in the hundreds of thousands and then you could even rent it at the Sari Sari store, right? But for many, many reasons, you know, these companies closed down and eventually there were no more big comic book companies in the Philippines. A couple of years ago, I was in my favorite comic book store in Manila, and as I was picking up my usual titles, I heard these three little voices behind me, and they were so excited by something. And I turned around, and I saw these three girls, and I just had to take a picture because they were naming each and every superhero on that shelf. And they were like saying, oh, this is Lobo, that's Cyborg, this is what he can do, and that's Supergirl. And I was, I was, you know, it just made my heart swell to know that there's a new generation of comic book readers. But it also made me think, what do we need to do to get this new generation of kids excited and say, oh, that oh that's a Pinoy hero, or she's a new Filipino hero, or I like this one, and have this shelf just get filled up with Filipino stories. So it is, um, it's, it, I am, uh, uh, me and Kajo are so, uh, um, I, 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 and I've suddenly lost words on like um, how far Trese has reached. And we are so thankful for our readers who have, uh, as far back as 2007, has used it as pasalubong <laughs> to share it with fellow Filipinos and, and, and family and friends abroad. And I do hope that um, eventually that this could be the start because we do have many, many, many fantastic uh, comic book stories, graphic novels in the Philippines and so many great creators. Uh, and I hope that the next time I visit this comic book store that this will, get me this will be filled with Filipino comics and that there will be more kids just going being really excited to pick up their favorite Filipino comic book character. Thank you very much. Oh. You can now go to your questions. Well, why don't you tell me you're gonna do this? So we've got some popcorn. This is so great, <laughs> guys. Um, Kajo, I have questions for you, but but before I have to um, say the budget two things. One's a question and one's a, uh, well, she's budget. After that story of your childhood, I guess Tracy is not horror fiction. It is a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing that you were as well adjusted as you are. Speaking of which, how is your child, by the way? Who tells the bedtime stories in that house? Is it your, when you when you yeah. when you went away to tuck him in the bed? Were you like, uh, all right, good night? And you're about to close the door and like, wait, did you hear something? 
Oh, ne <laughs> never mind, never mind. And then you close the door, or I haven't, I haven't used that tactic yet. But I might. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, yeah, the, I mean, what? Well, thank you so much for doing that. That took a lot of the heavy lifting off of me. And I mean, I'm just now I'm just a, audience, a viewer, an audience member again. I mean, and um, and I mean, as wonderful as as your words are, they wouldn't. It wouldn't be what it is without Kadro. I mean, just uh, from a fellow illustrator to another. I mean, how how do you start off? You know, I mean, forget all the horror and all the mythical creatures and all this deep stuff. The the thing I am most blown away by is a uh, budget. Send me a page, and then I'll I'll send you something in an hour. <laughs> that's the most impressive thing to me about this whole collaboration as far as I'm concerned from an illustrator's standpoint. Uh, when he sent you a page of a script, um, I mean, on your lunch hour, you would, you would do a page. That, that's what the legend is. Is it one of those things where, oh, it was actually three hours and then it's like, uh, and as a legend grows, it's like, no, it was one minute. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I hear stories that you did these on your lunch break. Uh, I guess something I want to ask is, what did you have for lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Red Bull or <laughs> how many pots of coffee? I mean, how much? How many candy bars? I mean, what, <laughs> and can you send some over here? You know, to help my productivity. You know? <laughs> it's uh, it's just rice. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's rice on a cup. No, uh, actually. Actually, it's even less than an hour because, yeah, I, I, I had to save myself about 10 minutes to eat because I need to, yeah, usually I don't eat breakfast. So that 10-minute that uh, 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 actual lunch break is essential uh, for me to survive the day. But uh, the thing about that one-hour challenge is that now that I'm thinking about it, is it actually made the it actually made the storytelling uh, real, uh, honest, and I don't know uh, simple simple because I usually when I, when you give me five hours or more to do a page, I'll just overthink it mm. and put a lot of non-essential things into the page that would uh, it would make the pages uh, prettier yeah. but not necessarily better in terms of telling the actual story what happened was I had 50 minutes to f finish that page so I'm I'm pretty much um, going by instinct that so, is from but that's from I mean, from start to finish, inked, I mean, from pencils to ink, you're not even doing thumbnails or anything like that prior. You're just, I mean, just go, that is it. Uh, actually, the, the thumbnails, the, the laying out of the story part takes uh, most of the time. Mm. That takes about 30 minutes to do that, to, to figure out how the story flows or if the, the, the page reads, or if I'm interpreting the script uh, properly. It takes all of the, uh, a, 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 the big chunk of that time. And so the inking part, the penciling the, and the inking part, that's the, that's the, that's the, that takes about less than 30 minutes. And so if you've seen the original volumes of Trece, that, uh, especially the photocopied ones, it's very, very, very rough. But I was happy with it. And well, Budge and I uh, were happy with it because it's just for us. Yes. We're doing it for us. It's a hobby. We're just entertaining ourselves. So when the opportunity to present the, the material internationally, that's when I decided uh, it, had to, <laughs> it had to be polished a bit. You know, that's so good. yeah. For the audience, that's what he's doing. By the way, he's, <laughs> he's been doing what one to one to one to seven, or uh, redoing the issues. I what had to, yeah, I had to spend more time on the on volume one because that that I think uh, was the roughest. 
uh, because when we started doing volume two, I had uh, I, I spent more time with it. Yeah. That's when that's when yeah I I still do the pages during lunch break, but after office hours, that's when I I I uh, ink the thing, the pages. But with the first volume, the, the that first four stories, those were done yeah during lunch break. Now, I mean, you were you come from a storyboarding background, and so um, when you're doing storyboards, obviously the frame is one is fixed, and the way that the the Tracy pages are just all over the place, but you can follow them. I mean, that's the thing. What inspires those kinds of compositions? I mean, uh, you'll do something where there's uh, a series of panels, and then, well, I mean, even this. You know, I mean, it's a series of panels. Well, here, sorry, camera. Mm -hmm. All right. Where it's a series of panels, but then, but the, but yet the full the figure takes up the whole page. I mean, what determines these types of compositions when you're doing it? Because I mean, you could easily just do square, 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 and it would and it would look really great. Will Eisner does that. Yeah. Really, yeah. You know. But yes, I mean, yes. you have the characters jumping out of frame, you have them in frame, and then maybe you'll, there was one story here, I'm not even sure it was here or in your bloodline story, but where you open up the page and then there is no frame. It's like, it's, it's like a spread, a full on spread, like a, like a piece, like, a, like an art, I mean, they're all art pieces, but I mean, but like a, like a standalone poster. I mean, how do you, how does that, how does that work in your mind where you're, you're thinking, okay, this this should be in panels, but then when I get to this page, what is it about budget's writing that says, okay, this has to be a whole spread with no borders per se, other than the actual dimensions of the spread itself? I mean, I know it's kind of a it's a bit of an abstract question to answer, but I this is probably the only time I'm going to get to talk to you for a while. So, <laughs> I mean, this as as a fan and as just uh, somebody who I mean. As a fellow professional, I'm just I'm just curious. Like, what dictates your compositions? How do you decide when to okay. go big, when to go small? You know. Okay. Um, actually, yeah, yeah. The the storyboarding, my job as a storyboard artist helped a lot in uh, telling the the story, the the flow, and that's uh, that's the first step in me um, composing the page. It's usually very, very simple six panel grids or even nine sometimes. That's when I, uh, I execute the story in those simple, simple traditional grids. And then when I see that the story is uh, flowing or it's clear, that's when I, okay, now that the story is clear, how do I make the page interesting? Because the page needs to be interesting for the, because it's a visual uh, medium, the audience had to be interested, had, had, to be, had to have the desire to, okay, now that I like what I'm seeing, I want to, now let me read it. So I have to make the, the page uh, um, not not really dynamic, but at least not boring. You know, so uh, that part uh, I was influenced by the Image Comics Revolution, and those those guys are known for their dynamic pages. Yeah, and what you said was it looks like a poster. That's usually how they lay out the their pages. Uh, there's a there's usually one very interesting page, and then the other pages are okay. <laughs> <laughs> or there's a very large face, and then they're, they they'll put in the the panels to tell the story. But then that, well, I um, I'm okay with that. But then sometimes uh, you will the the problem with that is that sometimes you you get too excited to make the the, the page interesting. Mm -hmm. And you lose the 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 objective to tell the story. 
So I, I make sure that I, I, I create the proper balance to tell the story and then make it pretty. Yeah, I mean, it's a perfect balance between restraint and then just going yes. for it. Um, mm -hmm. And the, and the secret, Carl, if, if I can jump in, the secret yeah, is because, because Kajo gets a very boring script for me and his job is to make <laughs> it look exciting. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. That's, <laughs> I feel it's almost exactly the opposite because I, reading your words, I mean, it's almost like thinking, how do I rise up to this level of, of script? You know, I mean, of, of trying to make yeah. it balance. That's what's, that's why this thing is, this, this is why this thing hits, you know, you guys. I mean, this is just the, um, a, the what I love that, about you know, it. I, I also saw, I saw the, um, during your presentation budget, there was a color image of, uh, of Tressa. What was that from? Because so far, everything I've seen is in black and white, with the exception of mm -hmm. that, that, um, that shot from the Netflix. Yes. So, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, a quick answer to that before. Kajo jumps back in. Um, we released um, the first three cases of Trece in full color, hmm. but we released it in Filipino. I see. Uh, and then we asked Bob Ong uh, to translate it uh, because I, I can't trust my own. I, I am ashamed to say that my writing in Filipino is not, uh, I'm not as confident as when I write in English. Hmm. Um, and and uh, and we are fan. Uh, me and Kajo are fans of Bob Ong's work. So and we're in the same publishing house. So we we asked him if he wanted to, if he was willing to come into our playground, and he said yes. Um, so there. So that's why. And we just thought that instead of releasing the same story in English in color, yeah, we we thought it would be great to release it in Filipino because uh, one of the things that triggered it is. Uh, one of the Trece stories was included by the Department of Education in their workbooks. So way back in, I think, 2013 or 2012, they asked us if we could translate one Trece case uh, and they included it in, a, in the workbook. So the workbook is a PDF file emailed to all of the teachers in public schools in the Philippines. Oh, so the teachers can then download that and use it for lessons. Wow. Um, because of that, we started to get email from high school students and elementary students asking, well, we would get email saying, Pwede, may assignment po ako. Pwede niyo pong sagutin <laughs> ang assignment ko. So, so they were asking us to, in, you know, interpret and analyze stress for them. But, we and and eventually years later we would get email from uh from from college students who said you know dear sirs i read your comics when i was in grade school and and now i can afford to buy all of your books so so we thought um you know because of that one story it it see you know we we now we realized we had um readers who were getting introduced to Trece in, in Filipino. So that, and that was the whole reason to, we thought, okay, let's start releasing it in Filipino, but let's give it something special. And it came out in color. Wow. Yeah, because I mean, it's, it's such a, it's, I mean, it's so powerful in black and white, you know, um, and it, of course it lends itself to the medium being a crime story, you know, so I was, I mean, I'm looking forward to see how it translates in color. I can only imagine, I mean, just on composition alone, Taja, you're so, I mean, it, you're lucky this thing, just on composition alone, it's already got it covered, you know? But um, with the addition of uh, color, I can only imagine how, you know, how much, uh, how it might be, given the, the sort of strong dynamic of contrast, you know, that you have in your work, you know? Um, who influenced you while you were growing up? I mean, besides image, <coughs> but I mean, but when you were both of you, actually, when you were um, when you were growing up, I mean, what were I mean, well, budget you had the real life experience of uh, that sort of thing happening to you to kind of uh, fuel your imagination. But Kajo, what about you? I mean, did you grow up with? Uh, I mean, obviously, you grew up with the boogeyman stories like we all did. But I mean, uh, uh, how much of that affected you in a way? I mean, was it just like, oh, that's cool, or you know, were you pop culture comics? And then uh, you know cartoons and that sort. Of thing. Yeah, uh, 
uh, personally, I never had any re- real uh, uh, supernatural experience in my life. There, there was none. But uh, I was inundated with, well, in the Philippines, there's probably more than two horror, horror uh, shows on TV. At that time, there, there, there were, I think, four channels, but uh, two of the channels would, would show, uh, yeah, uh, horror shows every week. So that's, that's, that, that was a great inspiration. And then comics um, in the 80s, mm-hmm. there used to be uh, Sari Sari stores who would rent out comics, Tagalog, uh, Filipino comic books every week they would rent it out for uh you can get probably for a dollar you can get 10 10 comic books for that so i did that every weekend i would rent out maybe six to eight titles and most of those titles are horror and those artworks um inspired me because uh normally they, they, they will be in color but the artworks are mostly mostly um, splattered, splattered with uh, black mm-hmm. ink because you know the, the printing is not that good. So the, the the artwork or the artist had to compensate. So that's uh, even before I was exposed to Marvel or DC Comics. I, I if I bought my first one when I was in high school when I was. Uh, 13 but at age probably six or seven i was already exposed to filipino comics so uh i think i can name uh nestor redondo and alex nino as one of my inspirations but then when i was in high school that was when x-men number one came out and then I saw Jim Lee's work, and that was that's when I decided that I need to do this for life. <laughs> I need to make this a career somehow. Uh, I, I don't think that happened yet, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, how much, how much of, uh, how much of this or, or early chess was analog and, and versus digital in terms of your inking work? Was it? I I think. I think the the first uh, seven stories were were traditional, mm-hmm. traditional inking, penciling, and then and then the story number eight or volume three. That's when I went digital. And now that I'm redrawing it or fixing it, I kind of went back to traditional. And how's that? Yes, I'm going scanning, back and forth. Scanning like old drawings back into the computer and then changing the backgrounds and stuff like that. I mean, has it made it easier for you? Does it sometimes with the advent of digital, there's so many choices yes. that, um, you know, again, you know, uh, you're talking about how when you were doing things for just an hour, you it was kind of spontaneous and there was more truth yes. in that spontaneity. Yes. Now that you have, uh, you know, the access to digital and being able to make endless decisions. Um, I mean, how, how has that affected, you know, you're, you're redoing the first three books. I mean, how is that, you know, you look remarkably well for a guy under that kind of pressure. I mean, how, how, how has it helped? Has it helped you or? Yes, it, it just made me not afraid to make mistakes because, mm-hmm. yeah, because even if you mess up the page uh, with your, with your uh, traditionally inking it, messing it up, you just just fix it on the computer uh, later. So that was uh, that was great. That was great. Yeah, yeah. To to add to the process. Yeah, I mean, I know that we're kind of running. I, we'll cut to a Q and A. I know that there's a lot of people that have questions for you guys, but um, uh, I just also want to also bring up also uh, this too. Bloodlines, incredible work um by you know by you guys and your friends i mean what was the origin of including collaborators into this world uh 
how much, how long after your initial creation of Tressa did you decide, okay, we gotta, we gotta expand this world and we're gonna bring in collaborators to do it? Um, I guess the, um, and, and the, it, it was, it's just fun to bring in old friends. Uh, and these are the same guys I was um, hanging out with when the proto versions of Tresse came about. Um, and then, yeah, along, along the way in Comic Cons and all of that, we got to meet new artists as well. Um, and by the time we hit book seven, we already introduced the rest of the Tresse family. So we just thought of, of you know, um, inviting old friends over, uh, teaming them up with new artists and uh, giving them, you know, opening up the playground and letting them uh, handle, uh, you know, different members of the Trece family. Uh, and, you know, it, it was just uh, fun to, uh, it, it just makes me go back to, you know, for me, for me, it was like, going back to high school again and just chatting with friends about, oh, let's do a really cool comic book story. But now it's in the Trece sandbox. And uh, yeah, it was fun to do. How much influence did you have on those stories? Did you just leave it up to them to write it? I mean, based on what they read from the previous books? Yep, we, I, the, uh, a lot of the characters they, they, I assigned to them uh, have, um, what do you call this? I mean, they, We've seen them in, in the Trece books, but as far as their backstory is concerned, I left it open. Mm -hmm. uh, so I acted more as editor uh, to their works just to make sure it won't contradict anything that will happen later on in the Trece books. Yeah, and for Kajo, how about you? Did you have any, uh, any say in terms of like art directing the different uh, illustrators that were on the different stories or was it just take it and run? Uh, I think there's a mute. You're muted, Kajo. Yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry. I just get out of the, their way. I let them do what they want to do, basically, and hope that they read the books enough to not to not to not totally uh, deviate from what was uh, what had been uh, done before. But basically, yeah, I just I just let them do what they feel like doing conversely, creatively. Conversely, does that affect uh, any further books going on that you guys are creating, you know, in terms of the, the, reg the, the regular Tracy series? I mean, because Bloodlines comes out and then, I mean, did you already have an outline for the whole arc of this character? I mean, I know you guys are brilliant, you know, I mean, <laughs> so, so, I Here, mean. Here's, you know. here's, the, here's the secret, Carl, just don't tell anyone. We're making this up as we go along. <laughs> I find that very hard to believe, John. <laughs> very hard to believe. You guys are drawing on way too many. You guys are hitting on way too many points. You know, like uh, on cylinders in terms of just firing. I mean, for this to be like some fluke. I mean, uh, it'll kill me if that's what is actually happening. You know, <laughs> you guys have to be deliberate, at least in some manner. You know, I I don't I. I, I, uh, I want to go back to something uh, Kajo said earlier about that there's something honest and authentic about giving yourself that one hour or 30 minutes so that you're not overthinking yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why we, I got delayed in writing, you know, everything after book three or book four <laughs> was uh, one of the guys, one of my friends said, so what's your plan for Trece? I said, I don't know. And he said, you got to have a plan. <laughs> and, and then when I sat down and started to think about it, then I, then I started to like, yeah, maybe I should have a plan. And more often than not, it stops me from, from writing the next thing. But like, for example, in book seven, which was when suddenly we had a story for two of the brothers. And um, that came out because I was so frustrated trying to tell Tres's story. I said, I need a break. I want to talk about that guy over there. Yeah. <laughs> and somehow that worked. And somehow it was like when I didn't have to think about, um, you know, or, you know uh, and, 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 and we've talked about this uh, in, in, in other places, but we did say that this will all come to an end on book 13. 
right? Mm-hmm. So, so in a weird way, we kind of have a target, but um, yeah, we're still figuring <clears throat> out how to get there. So, so in the same way, Kajo started this whole thing with a text message. We still send each other messages, you know, at three in the morning my time or you know six in the morning his time. He'll suddenly say, "Budge, <laughs> what if we do this?" And it's like, okay. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, and all of these messages just, I guess, end up in, in the back of my head. I write it down in a notebook. And the next time I come and sit down, it's like some of it will fall into place. Some of it will be forgotten. Uh, and then we'll pick it back up. So it's it's a nice game. It's trying to figure out, it's, it's really a juggling act of trying to figure out when when is that other ball going to fall and how and can we catch it <laughs> right <laughs> if right. it falls yes yeah, so you can pick the fruit you know um okay one quick question be- from me before we get to q a because I, I really want to get to everybody's questions but for you guys how disciplined are you <clears throat> when it comes to <laughs> okay i guess i got my answer <laughs> i was about to say mm-hmm. how disciplined are you at like budget do you like have an hour where like, nobody bother me i'm closing the door I got music on, or I'm going to listen to the birds chirp outside, or you know whatever Denmark has to offer, and then um, and I'm just going to carry on writing, like you're actually going to be doing this. But you know where you're where you're just piping, and and you have like two or three hours that you devote to that, or and and for you, Kajo, how is it? I mean, it's the same thing where you're you know you have a wife and child. Do you uh, do they say, oh, this is Daddy's time to kind of go off and do his thing? Don't bother him. I mean, what do you guys do in terms of? Because you guys are on this schedule, and especially you, Kajo, when you're like remastering the first three books, I mean, how do you, what, 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 is, your, what is your practice? Um, I, I used to, uh, <laughs> what you described, Carl, you sounded exactly like how things were bef- before, before Seraph came. <laughs> and now that I have a little boy, I think that schedule has gone out the window. So... <laughs> But yeah, I still try to carve out, a, a, you know, when, when he gets to sleep, then that's when I try to do a bit of writing. I don't get, I just feel these days, I don't get to write as much as before. I, I still love the days when I could sit down and finish a whole script in one night. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I need, uh, that's, that, um, I, I need to build strength uh, to do that again. How about you, Sergio? Uh, me, I just need to at least give four to five hours in a day uh, to that page. Uh, it doesn't matter what I, I can't really focus uh, on a thing. I can't sit for it. I I used to do uh, four hours straight just drawing a page, but I can't do that now because my, my back hurts and and the dogs are barking. Then you need to wash the dishes or something. But at at least I I, I devote five hours for the whole day. It doesn't matter if I need I I I spend one hour in the morning and then uh, the rest of the four hours at night it it's scattered. Uh, Thirty minutes here, twenty minutes there. But I make sure that the five hours for the day for that page is fulfilled okay all right um abe uh <clears throat> feel like i've talked enough uh thanks for putting up with me guys um mm. we have uh i've seen that we can chime in and have some questions from the chat if anybody has any questions uh are we on the desert island here or something gonna okay uh you're muted pal <clears throat> uh muted abe Unmute. Oh, sorry. Right. Oh, I'm I'm back now. Sorry. Thank you. Still getting used to the to the Zoom world. But anyway, yeah. no, thank you all three for a great uh, afternoon. It it was a deep dive into to Tressy. I, I'm just so amazed by all the different aspects of it. So yeah, let, let's uh, get into our our question Q and A from our our attendees today. So let me start out with. Uh, one from our uh, friend, Christina Newhart. She says, uh, some say our mythology holds keys to understanding Philippine identity. Was never there ever an aha moment where understanding a creature that gave you some in- new insight into Philippine history or culture? Um, thanks, thanks, Christina, for the, for the question. That's, um, I think, 
the aha moment came after. I'm not so sure if anything fed into the the stories, and maybe. And when I hear, especially when I hear Carl talk about the <laughs> the the stories he written, it's like, oh, so that's what we did. So <laughs> it, 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 we're never conscious of of how how people are are reacting to it or consuming it. Um, I mean, like one of the things I just remember reading your question. One of the things I remember back uh, is a sociology class uh, I took back in college, where there was where we talked about. Um, um, how the aswang or the white lady or the manananggal is was a form of, of social control. Mm. At least as far as the sociologists were concerned, that's how they were interpreting it, right? So that they were saying that these, these myths and these legends came about to essentially tell you, you know, don't trust the new one that's living outside of the body. Uh, don't trust the, the fair-skinned folk or don't trust the dark-skinned folk that are coming from the forest, right? So, so, so I mean, as a kid, the, the stories are still essentially the same. It's, they're meant to scare you. So I think in, in a way, you know, that, that somehow it, it became, uh, well, what's the term, watered down. I mean, it just became the very general oh, don't trust this person because he or she might be an aswang, right? Mm -hmm. But behind all of that, late, you know, I guess by the time it hit our generation, it just became the scary lady that lives uh, outside the body. But, you know, during that time and during that moment, you know, there were maybe other things that were happening that built that, uh, that legend of the dark-skinned, tobacco-smoking tall man, right? Uh, that 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 the message to everyone else was don't trust anyone who looks like that. So I think it it somehow still comes into play into the stories we tell. But I we're at me I'm never that conscious. I think uh, when I tell those stories. I mean, I, and I, sorry, just one last example. I guess the um, the the Chanak story. I mean, we couldn't. Um, the, the Chanak story for the longest time, at least for our generation, is the Chanak was introduced to us by Peke Galiaga, and we all knew it as the Anak Janis, right? Mm -hmm. But looking back into it, it was connected to it was connected to either miscarriages or it was connected to abortions. It was connected to unwanted pregnancies, right? The stories of the Chanak revolved around these. And these are things that what back then and even now they're they're you know we they're, they're they these are topics you don't want to talk about in the family right um, or or you you tend to 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 want to cover it up to certain generations um, so yeah in a in a way when we tried to put that Chanak story in a modern day context that's when I merged it with um, news about secret abortion clinics in Manila. So those two things just came together and eventually it became the Chanak story in, in Breto. Mm. Okay. Carl, do you want to read the next one on, under Q&A or, or you want me to just go through them all? Uh, I'll, I'll <clears throat> all right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> Christina Newhart says, uh, uh, asks, when you started working on Tracy, did you sleep with the lights on or off? Uh, um, the, the, I, I knew it was a good story when I switched on the lights. <laughs> Always a good barometer. Right, right. That's a new rating system. You know, how about you, Kaja? When you worked on it, I mean, it, it was, was it just a visual exercise or did you actually feel any chills or anything like that? When... Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, um, I think drawing dress is no different from drawing other uh, superheroes for mm -hmm. me yeah same same feeling of excitement and uh fun no, i'm not scared at all when i'm drawing <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay go ahead let me take on the next one it's a, a serious question uh, from a uh, jody blanco it says 
does the investigation of crimes by Tresi ever cross over into the world of EJKs under President Duterte, the imprisonment of his critics or the assassination of reporters and local politicians that were get, run against his cronies? That would be, I guess, more a comment. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's 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 really interesting. I mean, how much of that stuff finds it's how much of reality? I mean, you know, you have your tabloid papers, which give very fantastic stories. So I mean, I guess reality is kind of a blurred line or subjective, you know, but how much of some of these more actual incidents or, you know, um, reported incidents find a way into your into your stories, whether it be subconsciously or consciously? Yeah, a lot of I think uh... I, I can probably pinpoint several Trece stories that really came from the headlines. Um, so, whoa. Is that a sign, Kajo? Is, is yeah. your house haunted? The poster behind you just fell. <laughs> it's, either go it's either ghost or just bad uh, scotch bad tape. <laughs> So I don't know. I mean, to, to, to answer that question, I don't know. Uh, obviously, it's it's something that, that can't be ignored. It's in the headlines all the time. But it, it um, and so many comic book stories have been written about what is happening now in the Philippines. So um, um, if it ever gets, if, if, a, if a case like that ever comes up in Tres's universe, then um, yeah, it would have been, you know, us figuring out how to tell it in from a different point of view. Mm -hmm. But yes, a lot, I think, you know, a lot of the cases of Trece were based on some real world headline or some historical footnote that we saw. And then it was a question of, uh, and it was like, it would be like an unsolved case. So, so then it became a question of, well, what if it happened because of and then I would connect it to a creature from Philippine folklore. Mm. So maybe, we don't know, we'll see. <laughs> okay. uh, Carl, you wanna get the next one? Oh, uh, Carl, you're muted. All right. Um, okay, uh, from Sharice Del Rosario, who asks, what made, you decide, what made you decide on an animated show versus a live action series. That, that's, that's not hard. <laughs> um, that, that's um, because Netflix was looking for an animated series. Oh. Um, to, uh, I, will, I will try to tell the shortened version of this, but uh, the reason why Trece is going to be on Netflix is because of, of another dynamic duo. Tanya Yuson and Shanti Harmain are the producers of the Trece um, animated series, along, of course, with Jay Oliva, who came on board as executive producer and showrunner. But uh, we met Tanya 10 years ago. So Tanya and Shanti have been pitching Trece for 10 years. And the, the original pitch was they were attempts to pitch it as a movie. There were attempts to pitch it as a live action TV show. Mm -hmm. All of them did not push through for many, many reasons. And then in 2018, they heard that uh, Net uh, Netflix anime division opened their doors and said, we want to produce anime from other countries. They pitched Trece and here we are now. And in a way, it kind of worked out. In, in a way, because of what Trece is all about. I mean, the, 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 one of the reasons why the live action stuff was so difficult to get through was because they wanted it to be produced in the best way possible. Right. You know, how, how, how can you bring to life a tikbala? How can you bring a, to life you know, a manananggal in the best way possible? Um, so there was, um, and, and now, you know, through anime, I think it's, it will, uh, it, it's going to be a great way to, to adapt it. Actually, and, and just another uh, qu quick question that's sort of related. Kajo, in, in the design of Trese, uh, was there, did you have any like, because sometimes if, if, I'm, if I'm coming up with characters or something like that, I'm always thinking of actors and actresses just because I'm so connected to movies and TV, you know, in addition to comic books. But was there, was there anybody that you modeled the character after that, that's in popular culture or? 
with like a relative or something or you know. oh well uh partially i i think i was really a fan of ghost in the shell at the time mm. so maybe there's a, a there's a little bit of major kusanagi uh-huh. <laughs> interesse <laughs> Okay. And then, and then there was a time when I was uh, 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 modeling her after my own uh, girlfriend because she was feisty, and then <laughs> we broke up. <laughs> Until we broke up. No, but 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 it's okay. We're uh, we're married now, so all is well. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Saw that. <laughs> you dodged that, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Aiden, want to take the next one? No, yeah, I'll do the next one. Uh, Justu Numali asks, uh, I noticed that the spells in the English uh, versions are in Filipino, uh, but the spells in the Filipino version are in Bai Bai In, just a guess. Oh, what's the reason for that? Because we messed up the Bai Bai In. Huh? <laughs> so the original, um, in the first couple of of Trece stories, and you'll see it if you have the original 2008 mm-hmm. book. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the first issue, it was just a gibberish font that Kajo found. And then yeah. eventually we tried Bye Bye In. Mm-hmm. And during one of the Comic Cons, one guy approached us in UP. So the guy yeah. studied Bye Bye and he like shows <laughs> the comic book. I mean, Malito. <laughs> you guys got it wrong. Oh. And then he said, okay, let's stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Which goes to show how lazy we are. It's like, you know, should we study by buying? No, let's just change the whole spell process. <laughs> then, <laughs> so we then changed it to Filipino. And one of the things I did uh, to make it different, because, um, you know, in Harry Potter and all of these other uh, magic users, usually they... The, the spell is very long, right? When you pass the spell. So one of the things we did with Trece was she just has one keyword to activate the spell. Um, so, so like I, when she activates the, the eyeball spell, she says testigo. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's uh, trying to find that, uh, that one keyword to, to activate the, the spell just to make it different from all of the other spell casters out there. And that's the reason why we're not using by buying anything. Oh, okay. I thought something more sophisticated. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Are there um, are there anything? I guess uh, okay. well, there's quite a bit of questions out there. Yeah. Um, are there plans for crossovers to other Filipino comics like Tabipo, Ella Archangel, and others? Um, uh, th- those are uh, uh, those are made, of course, by Mervin Malonzo and Julius Villanueva. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be great to to have a team up uh, with them sometime in the future. But I think we're they're busy doing stuff, and we're doing this now. I mean, this is one of the things we've started exploring bloodlines. Mm-hmm. So yeah, one of the bloodline storyline is a collaboration with David Hontiveros, who created the superhero Dakila. Yeah. Um, so there, so we've, we've opened that door. So something we can continue to explore, you know, in the future. Okay. Uh, let me just go through some of the Q and A because actually, uh, yeah, there's there's quite a bit. So uh, I I think you kind of answered it, but you don't have any clue. Uh, this is one question of when the Netflix series is going to be actually released, right? Soon. Soon. Mm-hmm. This year. It will happen this year. Believe okay. me, okay. it will happen this year. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, l- let me just go through it. Uh, any comics, Filipino comics, you guys are excited to read or get in the near future? Either for both you or Kajo? Kaj. Any... Mm. 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 It, it, it's so hard <laughs> to find time to read now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's see. Uh, how did you? Uh... I think I think a lot of the. Sorry, sorry, Abe. Just yeah. to uh, answer that, I think a lot of the. Uh, there are now a couple of titles from that are in Archipelago. So okay. I think even the books of Mervin Malonzo and his yeah. uh, studio are available in Archipelago. So yeah, Tabipo and El Arcangel, 
I think are the ones, especially if you, if the readers are looking for more urban fantasy horror type stuff. Okay. Um, oh, and by the way, there is pen. Uh, please do visit penlab.com. So penlab is a website that started a year ago. They are uploading Filipino comic books for free. Thank you, Motsi. Penlab.ink. That ink. <laughs> I don't know where penlab, penlab.com will bring you. Maybe pens. Uh, penlab.inc. So yeah, we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, new and old Filipino comic books. You can read it for free there. They have started to put links on where you can buy them. But yes, it's a, it's a great platform to see more, discover more Filipino uh, comic book titles. And I think with the titles in Pen Lab, I think my, my dream of those three little girls looking up at a shelf filled with stories, I think uh, is, is already happening thanks to Pen Lab. That's great. Okay. Um, there's a uh, Philip Rusty. I saw that Tresse Volume 3 is coming out July 13th. They say they don't see it, however, in the latest previews. Will it be listed late in the next previews? I'm not sure what that means. I don't know if I, I think, I, if I remember correctly, it, uh, volume three might be scheduled for September. Okay, okay. All right, uh, next one. Uh, if Trece could be a crossover with any comic in the world, what would it be? God, you want to answer that? Yeah. Batman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, you, you guys did a great piece with a night at the museum with him and also uh, Wolverine. Wolverine, yeah. Yeah, that was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I, again, that was a Kajo idea who said, you know, so a bunch, if you just want to scratch that itch of <laughs> doing a Batman Wolverine story, let's do it. And, and that's what happened. So yeah, it's it's all for fun. Yeah. DC Marvel, please don't sue us. But if you want to publish it, <laughs> if you want to publish it, hey. <laughs> uh, here's another one for... And Constantine. Yes, yes, Motsi. Yes. Constantine, Constantine and Preston would be great. Um, let's see. For budget, what is the process of writing the story? Do you follow a structure? Is there anyone you talk to when writing it? It just seems so intriguing. I wanted to understand what goes through your mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kajo telling me to limit it to 20 pages was the biggest help ever. <laughs> because, because if it wasn't for that 20 page limit, I, you know, I would not have had the discipline to stop. Um, um, I also think that working in advertising was where we picked up the discipline of you need to tell a story in 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, if you break down the storyboards of a 30 second TVC, it's almost like what a 12 page comic book, I think, oh, okay. or like a 10 page comic book. So I think being in advertising was where, um, I, I learned that I can tell a story in a short form. Um, but yeah, so, so uh, really quickly, the, there's usually the, the crime scene is what first usually comes to mind. Um, and then I write down uh, pages one to 20 on the side of a, of a pad. And then I write down what happens on each page. Or it's like they did, you know, they find the white lady at page one, page 20, press assaults it. And then I just work my way down to 20. Um, I, I then, from there, I write the script, I write the dialogue. And that's, and sometimes I write too much dialogue, which we have to cut out because of the 20 page limit. Um, and that's the reason why a lot of Hank, the bartender, got cut out. And eventually we put, those stories into another book, which was stories from the diabolical. Mm. Um, oh, wow. Okay. But there, so so really roughly, that's how uh, a typical Trece story gets done. But lately, like in book seven, uh, I sent Kajo like um, uh, a Marvel style script with no with not much page breakdowns. So I think Kajo had uh, fun uh, translating that. Uh, 
uh, script into into the pages and panels. So we ended up with stories that were longer than 20 pages. Mm. Okay. Uh, we have another one from uh, Rick Robin Cognan. He says, for budget, your thoughts on Hell of a Boss? It's a web cartoon created by Vivian Medrano, aka Vizzy Pop. These three remaining characters are reminding me of Tresia and the Kambal twins, except these demons, the main characters from Hell of a Boss, were hired assassins. Are, are you familiar with it? Oh, but thank you for sharing that. Let me, I'll, I'll check them after this chat. Okay. All right. And then check with your lawyers afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, there were, there were, there were, it was so scary because when, 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 Tres, when we first released Trese, I think I, I found the book in the, in the in national bookstore about, uh, I think, what, what was her name? Lilith Crow. But I mean, she was like, I think she was a vampire that investigated crime. Mm -hmm. And then there was also people were comparing it to um, uh, the Dresden Files. And he's a wizard that also is a detective. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, there are, it, it's not, it's the, the, the template for the character has been done mm -hmm. a lot of times, except mm -hmm. no one's done it set in Manila. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's one from uh, John Carlo Pereras. He says, "Are there any Tresic characters that that represent uh, family or friends?" Oh, uh, uh, not really. I mean, a lot of them are named after. <laughs> a lot of them are named after family and friends. But mm. as far as the looks are concerned, I don't know if Kajo has based them on. Yeah, none. <laughs> none. <laughs> no, no, no creatures, no creatures uh, that were modeled after any acquaintances or anything like that, or <laughs> enemies. Yeah. No, none. No. Okay. Not, not, not that we're aware of. Mm. Okay. And uh, now I'm, I'm going to go to some that were sent uh, via email. Just a few. Um, one ask. Um, mm -hmm. How did you two get in contact with Jay Oliva? But I, I think you kind of answered that. Uh, the young man was saying, Kevin Inseong was saying, I was lucky to have him as a teacher while he started working on Tresier. And he got me excited about the project. I grew up watching American cartoons and never saw myself represented. And I'm happy it is coming to be, to, to, to be in my lifetime, meaning Tresier on, on, on board as a Netflix anime, so. Yeah, it was it was Netflix who picked him, yeah. uh, and and it was a very very conscious decision to make this uh, to make the anime team yeah. as Pinoy as possible. Oh, great! So so yeah, from from Jay and his team, the art director of Trece is Pinoy. Jojo, uh, Jojo, Kajo got to meet him in Manila. Um, the voice actors are mostly Phil Am uh, um, uh, for, for the U.S. cast. And of course, they're now dubbing the Filipino version. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, Netflix was the one that said, you know, make this, make this as Pinoy as you can. You know, mm -hmm. make Pinoy culture and folklore shine with this project. Oh, so they, they, didn't, they didn't hold back on that. So uh, just to follow up on that, do you have a lineup of all the characters that will be Phil M, uh, voice actors or, or actors that will be doing the English version of Tres I own I only know some of them, uh, but yeah, hopefully when they when they when they announce the, uh, especially when the series goes uh, on the platform, then. Uh, I think we'll we'll get the full list of that. But yes, I mean, from Tanya would would uh, slowly, you know, and so just and to anticipate the next question, me and Kajo are are, are hands off with the, right. with the production. Yeah. yeah. So me and Kajo spent Kajo spent a day with Jay and Jojo. I also did it via a Zoom call with his writing team. Mm -hmm. uh, but at, and that was at the beginning stage of the anime. But after that one day with them, it was they were it was completely up to them on on what to do with it. Um, so yeah, so Tanya has told me of some of the cast members. 
Uh, so very exciting to hear uh, these these actors and actresses be part of Trece. So so soon we hope we can talk more about them. Okay, so you're not at liberty to reveal their names right now, correct? <laughs> no, unless you want the Laman Lupa to suddenly come here and like grab me. <laughs> okay, uh, we, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll, uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, uh, just quickly though, um, uh, budget. How much of the Netflix the, the Netflix stories that you've read, have they had any influence on what you're going to write for the remaining books? Do you think, oh, that's a good idea? I mean, because I know that you're looking past, I mean, you said that I, I read or I heard in interviews that they sort of taken what you've got, what you guys have, have done, and then sort of ran in their own direction. And you said it sort of surprised you in certain ways, but that they managed to keep the spirit of it. Now, uh, have you sort of taken, oh, you read their script, I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. Maybe I should go in this direction instead. Or, you know, has it, has it, do you think it's influenced anything? Or? I, I think uh, it, I found it surprising that they, um, they, they echo a lot of stuff that me and Kajo have talked about. Mm -hmm. so, and, and these are the, the usual Kajo budge text messages happening at six in the morning, three in the morning, right? <laughs> so when I heard what they were planning to do, it's like, oh, so you're doing that. Um, but I think I will try as much, we will try as much as we can to, to stick to, you know, what we've already planned. Um, so yeah, let's see. I mean, they, they've, in any adaptation, you know, they, it, it, it's so the, the surefire way to, for an adaptation to fail is if you try to adapt it, you know, frame by frame, panel by panel, it's, sure. it's a completely different medium. So I think what they've done with Trece is um, they've made it really work out as an anime uh, storyline. So, so yeah, I mean, um, uh, who knows if, uh, if in the back of my, you know, in the back of my head, uh, some plot line or character will pop up. Uh, but again, I think we want to keep the two things very distinct. Pajo, have you have you drawn any visual inspiration from what you've seen from the art team? For um, no. Um, no, actually, I haven't. What they have released in the public so far is what I. That's the only thing I also saw. So okay. yeah, yeah, we like Baji said, we were hands off. Yeah. Uh, it's their thing. Okay. Okay. Well, well, that's great. I, I think we'll have to. We've got a lot, but uh, we can, we have to. Kind of unfortunately end our our time with you this afternoon i want to thank oh, typical filipino you know talking story we just yeah, yeah we, we, we can't overstay our welcome <laughs> well I, it's never that way it, it's and that's the filipino way but uh thank you Abe, is it okay to to tackle one last question yeah. no go ahead because i remember um uh, because you shared with me uh some questions via yeah, email I did. And I think one of the, the guys now on, on chat, I think it's Rick, okay. um, sent a question to us, Kajo, asking about, um, um, you know, he, he's, uh, I think Rick is, is an aspiring artist. Right. And he's just asking, yeah. you, know, um, uh, you know, what keeps us going? Uh, uh, you know, um, any, any tips for him on his wanting to be uh, uh, an artist, um, and and I think and so so uh, if to to, answer, to try and answer that question, I wish we had another hour. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's um, I mean um, I just want to make a point to Rick and to everyone out there. You know, me and Kajo still have day jobs. <laughs> mm -hmm. The the dream the dream is you know to be. Jim Lee to be Neil Gaiman and that we do this, you know, you know, as, as that we make a living doing, you know, Trece. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be fantastic when that happens, you know, if ever we reach that, that, that status. But for now, it's the, when we make Trece, we're essentially making the photocopied comic book back in 2005. We're just lucky enough that we now have people who support us and it's now being read by more and more people. Yeah. So it is still a passion project. It's still a hobby in a way. Um, and I think 
that's what this is uh, and but the 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 knowledge and skill we use for making the comic book is the same knowledge and skill we use to make money to make a living yeah yeah so if you are an artist then please by all means try and find a way to use your art to mm-hmm. make a living yeah. One of my favorite comic book artists is a writer, for that matter, is Brian Michael Bendis, and his his uh, you know his success story is he used to draw caricatures at bar mitzvahs. That's how he made money. He would you know attend parties, people are drunk, and he'd have to draw them, and he was doing that up to the point when he was already writing Spider Man. And he said he stopped doing caricatures when finally uh, Spider-Man reached, I think, issue four or five, when he realized, oh, it looks like they didn't fire me. <laughs> I have a job. But, you know, it, uh, sometimes you might already have the dream project in front of you, but you still need to keep doing that, that, that gig that makes you money. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I do advert, you know, in advertising, and I'm still in advertising, by the way. So my job every single day, my ideas get rejected. I have to pitch ideas to my partner, then to my boss, then to the client, mm-hmm. and I get rejected at every single stop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the next day I have to come back with a new idea. Mm-hmm. So Trese is the one project me and Kajo can do where nobody rejects us, mm-hmm. right? That, that's the deal me and Kajo have. I write a script, I send it to him, he'll draw it. He's not going to tell me, budge, this sucks. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then he sends pages to me, and when he sends pages to me, I, you know, I don't tell him, but Kajo, this sucks, change this. You know, it's, we're doing it for fun. So, so I think that that would be my, you know, uh, uh, that's my take on it. Uh, it might not work for everyone. Um, and yeah, so, so, so Rick says, I have a day job twice working on local government unit in entry-level position. Uh, uh, Stephen King. Stephen King was working at a laundry and he was typing his stories while he was at the laundry. Until eventually he, he got to, he, he sold the story. Yeah, it's... Uh, um, it, it's part of the deal. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I'll shut up now. <laughs> gotcha. I just want to. I just want to make a clarification. A uh, misconception. Uh, everybody thinks that Tresi is a success. It's not. <laughs> it's not a success because if it is, that's yeah. Like Baj said, we we won't be doing. Uh, we won't be having day jobs. We'll, we'll just do that, Tresi. But we're not. But we just, you know, we just kept on doing it because we love it. So maybe, maybe that's the, that's the, that's the thing. Do it because you love it. Don't make a goal out of it, you know. And maybe you're doing it so much. You you kept doing it uh, that someday you get lucky, or you might not. But just keep doing it anyway. I'll do it because you're trying to rep Filipino comics and 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 trying to bring it back up to where it was in in the '60s and prior to that. No, we thank you for that being part of that movement. So that was a good one to end on. Yeah, no, that very good. Thank thank you, Butch and Kajo, and Carl. Thank you, bringing us to the world of Tressy and beyond, and and giving people inspiration on trying to realize their careers you know like you said uh, sometimes you really do keep the day job for most of your life but then you you have this passionate hobby that that makes an impact in so many people's lives you know you've, you've got a, a a long-standing fan base that have uh, are waiting on pins and needles for the next story and i i can imagine just even the recent one where where you where you get basilio knocked off oh my god <laughs> You know, so you know the, the combal split. Uh, you know, so anyway, it, it hey, just, spoilers! <laughs> if, if, if you're following them on on their Tressy page or on Facebook, the, okay. the story's all over the place, and 
people are bewailing the, the loss of Basilio, right? <laughs> well, the story is not finished yet. So anyway, th thank you guys again for, for joining us this afternoon and morning and evening. On <laughs> morning. Thank you again for coming up to us at, at four in the morning, uh, Davao time. We, we, we are totally in your debt. We are not worth you to all you guys. <laughs> Good Thank afternoon, you. good evening, and good morning. Great. Thank, Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great weekend. Yeah. Thanks again, folks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Honor, gentlemen. The honor is all mine.